classical conditioning. So if they're sitting in the classroom and they're diligently taking notes, almost always I'll walk by and I'll just hit their pen and they'll make a line across their paper and it annoys the crap out of them. But that's actually fun because it lines right into when you talk about cognitive dissonance. Because let me sideboard a cognitive dissonance, a quick little tip. They hate taking notes. Do um, so we have to take notes today again? And then I say yes. So I hate it. Well, if they hate it so much, why do they get mad if I hit their paper? So it's a very weird thing. They hate doing it, but they value it once they've done it. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun kind of trick to play. So for weeks, I'll walk by, people in the front row will hit their pen, and I'll hit their pen, and they get very mad because they really value their pretty cursive eyes dotted with the hard handwriting. Eventually, they've learned, and they'll flinch. Every time I come by, they'll learn to pull it away. So eventually, when I get within two or three feet, all of them will pull their hand up. So if I walk down a row, it's kind of neat to see. If I, as soon as I walk down a row, every single one of them will pick their pen up, and they've been trained that just my presence will be a behavior. Now, what's interesting is this is durable throughout the year, and I usually hit classical conditioning maybe in end of November. It's in March. They'll still do it. I haven't hit their pen in, in months, and it's not conscious. They've actually been trained to pull their pen up when I come near them. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, and I don't tell them why I do it. So in September and October, while I'm training, I walk by and randomly hit their pen. Why? Why'd you do that? It's so mean. I won't tell them. I won't tell them. And then it's an amazing kind of revelation when we get to the classical condition. Look, you weren't aware of this behavior, but now it's, a, it's an instinctual, it's an unconscious level of behavior. Priming's a fun one, um, and I, I want to make sure that I also uh, give you all, before I leave, a, a way to contact me. I have a pretty good internet program or web program. If you have a screen like this or a Promethean board or something like this, I have a pretty neat program that will allow you to flash any JPEG you want. And you can program it for 1 30th of a second, 1 27th of a second. Um, and what it will do is if you're lecturing, if your lecture notes are up here, it will flash really quickly any picture you want. Okay, so what, I, what you'll do is you'll prime the students through a kind of subliminal, and you can kind of weave it in either research or subconscious or perception or whatever you want to do, however you want to work it in. And Let's say at the beginning of class, uh, I just have a, a triangle flash 20 times in an hour. They don't know. Maybe they know. What was that? The screen just flicker. You got to get just right. At the end of class, I'll do a quick survey. What was your favorite plant? What was your favorite table? What was your favorite shape? And almost all of them will say triangle because they've been exposed to triangle 20 times in the last hour. They don't know it. But it's a pretty neat thing with, um, with uh, subconscious processing. If you don't if you don't have that program, which I'm happy to share with you guys. The other one is priming. Um, and if you look through this, I'll weave through, and this kind of takes some reversal. It's a little bit harder to pull off, but it's kind of fun. You weave through your discussion for 45 minutes or an hour, however long your class is, be it block or period, whatever. You find a way to insert a theme of something. And if you say, hey, what, um, Jerry Sandusky, what, was the, what is the, um, the mascot of Penn State? Nittany lines. Okay, so we'll say something like that. And then we'll find another way to talk about a big jungle cat. You gotta weave it in, or if you're good extemporaneously, you weave it in. And then once we've done throughout the class lecture, we found a way to talk about the Nittany lines. Okay? Or we talk about, hey, what's uh I don't know, we talk about a saber-toothed tiger, we talk about Puma, Cincinnati Bengals, Detroit Lions, or somehow or another, we work in big jungle cats. At the end of the class, you'll do an activity. Again, don't tell them what's coming. And then you'll say, hey, um, what's your favorite animal? Write it down in the next card. You have it pass it up. And you're going to see a statistically significant set of students are going to say a big jungle cat is their favorite animal. So you can do that with one class. And the other class, don't prime. And then have them do, of course, the index cards at the end of the class. Have them pass up the index cards. You're going to have every animal in the world. If you prime them, and we can, you can weave this into persuasion with advertising, the mere exposure effects of conscious processing, there's a lot of fun you can do with this. So that was priming. The next one, operative conditioning, token economy. This one is, is usually the most fun one, similar to uh, Marco Polo. It's called a hot and cold game. You have a student again leave the room. Usually you want to get your most vivacious students because it does involve a tiny bit of, of stress. So you have little Susie or Johnny leave the room, and then you tell the kids, look, we want to train them to do a behavior. And the behavior in the students can, of course, vote on. We want them to be as interactive as possible. 
And so we say, we want them to come over here and stand on this chair. But we're only allowed to give them the reinforcement of hot and cold. Hot being a reward, cold being a punishment. So you say to the student, come in, and you say, look, you have to figure out a behavior. We're not going to say any words. So of course the student's going to go over here, and the class yells hot, or cold. Hot. Hot. And you can use this with all of your operant conditioning vocabulary, shaping, successful approximation, or things like this. And you'll be very surprised. And you can even tell the class before this begins, do you think it'll work? Many of you have in my experience, they say, no. There's no way we're going to get a person to stand on that chair, or to erase the board, or to go crawl under a desk. There's no way. I say, I'll tell you what. Not only, not only will they do it, they'll do it in under two minutes. And all my students say, no way. It is amazing how quickly you can shape someone's behavior just with a hot and cold thing. Of course, once, and it works really, really well. The pro, what I find the most important part of this lesson is not the subject, okay, hot and cold, they can follow the directions, it's the trainer. The, and usually you pick one person instead of a whole class shouting out hot and cold. Because what you're really going to learn to get deep into operant conditioning is you have to have precise and immediate feedback to specific behaviors. So if a person raises their hand, you have to raise their foot to walk, that's hot. If they walk two, three feet and then you say hot, it's already gone. So then you can really start to work into schedules of reinforcement and other really precise. I think everyone gets reward and punishment, but if you've ever dealt with a puppy or a child, you know that actually applying it is pretty hard to do.